Monks in D&D are inspired by kung fu movies. At least they originally were. D&D players have since used the class to represent all sorts of warrior characters with a variety of backgrounds, and that's one of the things I really love about this game. However, there's nothing wrong with a good old martial arts movie, so stick with us to see how you would play one in Dungeons & Dragons. Hi everyone, and welcome to another action-packed episode of The, the Dungeon, Dungeon Crashers. Crashers. I'm Guy. And I'm Sapeel. Before we get started, remember to like and subscribe, and turn on that bell if you want to be notified when we post our informative D&D content. Today we are doing a request from a viewer, uh, Joseph Davis, who wants a multi-class fighter monk that uses unarmed fighting style. This seems a little redundant, as monks already have unarmed fighting, but it offers some interesting advantages. The style does more damage at low levels than a monk's unarmed strikes, and multi-classing with monk means we can still use the dexterity rather than strength. This will allow us to take less levels in monk and focus on getting more interesting abilities from fighter. Now that we have finished our Ravnica series, we'll get back to doing some more multi-classing to show off the synergy we get between the classes. When mixing martial characters, it is important to focus on one of them at low levels because it's important to get extra attack as soon as possible. Sometimes this can be a difficult choice, but in this case we are going to prioritize Monk early on in order to get key empowered strikes, then switch our focus to fighter for much of the rest of the build. Adding fighter will also open up some fighting options to complement our Monk abilities. While we are going to prioritize punching, which is what Joe Davis seems to want, we are going to add some variety as well. Some of the martial arts movies Guy and I like best are movies like John Wick, Kill Bill, and anything featuring Chow Yun Fat. Movies that mix martial arts and gunfighting, or crossbow fighting depending on your DM. We will be building this to use a pistol, but it can be done with a hand crossbow with only minor changes. We don't use the variant human race very often in the Dungeon Crashers because other races are frequently more fun or suit the character we want to make. We save that race for situations where either being human just feels right for the character or our concept revolves around a particular feat. This character checks both of those boxes, so that's what we are going to use. Human variant have the simplest racial abilities to explain. They get a plus one bonus on two ability scores of our choice. A bonus to skill proficiency and a choice of one feat. This is pretty basic, which is the point, but it is still really good. Feats are powerful, and though they aren't always worth giving up cool abilities that the other races get, some of them can enable an entire combat style. Feats like Polar Master, Sharpshooter, Great Weapon Master, Crossbow Expert, and such are the basis for an entire character archetypes. The one we are taking is Gunner. It's from Tosh's Cauldron of Everything. It gets proficiency with firearms, allowing you to ignore the reloading property of firearms and don't get disadvantage on range attacks for being within five feet of a hostile creature. If your DM doesn't allow firearms, instead take Crossbow Expert. The build will be essentially the same except for the ability boost at fourth level and we will explain that then. If you are using a crossbow expert, you will start with the light crossbow, but can later use hand crossbows and heavy crossbows once you gain the proficiency. For our free skill, we are going to take Perception. As a highly trained fighter, we have honed our senses and are ever alert for threats. For our background, we are using the athlete background from the Mythic Odysseys of Theros. This is a setting based on ancient Greece, and this background is intended to represent the Olympian, but can be adapted for any highly trained athlete. It gives proficiency with the skill of athletics and acrobatics. It also gives proficiencies with land vehicles so you can have that cool hot rod chariot that you will brutally hunt down anyone who steals it. You get proficiency with one language of your choice. There isn't a language that this character needs uh, for flavor reasons, so choose something useful for your campaign world. It also has the feature Echoes of Victory, which means that when within 100 miles of your home, you have fans and admirers that give you 50% chance of having someone available to provide information or shelter. You can also earn money competing in athletic competitions. There's a table for what type of competitor you were, and Boxer is on the list, so we'll be going with that. <laughs> Using point buy on our abilities, we're putting 10 on strength. We don't need strength, but as an athlete, we shouldn't have a negative. We put 15 on decks, making it 16 with one of our bonuses, and 17 if you took the gunner feat. Dexterity is our primary stat, and capping it is a priority. We put 14 on constitution, needing to be fit and in good shape. We put 10 on intelligence. We don't really need it, but I don't see this character as unintelligent. We put 13 on wisdom, making it 14 with our second bonus. Wisdom helps with our armor class and monk abilities, as well as our perception, so we're going to be investing in it quite a bit. Lastly, we put 10 in charisma. For roleplay reasons, I would love more. 
but we don't need it for anything and can dump it. But I don't think having a negative would suit this character. At first level, we're starting with Monk for two reasons. We want to be able to punch using dexterity, and we want unarmored defense. We get two skills from the Monk list, and we want history, because in my campaign, it gets used for a lot of general knowledge questions, and we should know a bit about politics and traditions despite our average intelligence. And we also want stealth. We may love a straight-up fight, but we know that sometimes avoiding trouble is more effective than wasting bullets on it. And we get proficiency with simple weapons and short swords. We get proficiency with strength and dexterity saves, and proficiency with our choice of an artisan's tool or musical instrument. Pick something that suits your roleplay concept. Painting or calligraphy supplies would suit a classic martial artist, as would most musical instruments. We're going to be rocking a kick-ass mandolin to complement our cool guy personality. <laughs> For weapons, we will carry a short sword because it does slightly better damage than our fists. After we get second level, this won't be important, but should instead carry a dagger, both for style and utility. But we will be better off fighting with fists. For now, however, the short sword can be useful. We will also carry a pistol. A pistol is a light, one-handed range weapon that has a short range of 30 feet and a long range of 90 feet. It deals 1d10 damage and has a loading property, which we can ignore if we took the gunner feet. A pistol does cost 250 gold pieces, so we may have to start with a light crossbow. We will also use the light crossbow if we took the crossbow expert feat instead of gunner. Monks get martial arts that they can use when not wearing armor or using a shield. They can use dexterity instead of strength for, un for unarmed strikes and monk weapons. Their unarmed strikes deal 1d4 damage, and this dice improved as they gain monk levels. And when they use the attack action to strike with a monk weapon or unarmed strike, they can make an unarmed strike as a bonus action. Monks also get unarmored defense that allows them to calculate their armor class as 10 plus their dexterity and wisdom modifiers when they aren't wearing armor or using a shield. At second level, we're taking a quick dip into fighter. First level fighter gives us proficiency with simple and martial weapons and all armor. We won't be wearing armor, but the weapon proficiencies will be useful. If we're using crossbow experts, this is especially useful, allowing us to use a hand crossbow to get the bonus action shot that the feat gives, and we can also carry a heavy crossbow for the extra damage if we like but it doesn't really suit our fighting style. Also, if we want to use a rapier, we can. It won't count as a monk weapon, however, so it isn't the best choice. Fighters also get a fighting style at first level, and we are taking unarmed fighting. Our unarmed strikes deal a d6 damage, which is better than we'll get from monk for some time, and if we aren't wielding a weapon or shield in our other hand, our unarmed strikes deal a d8 instead, which is as good as an 11th level monk. Our fighting style should be using a pistol or hand crossbow in one hand and mixing shots with unarmed strikes. We also can and should sheathe the crossbow or pistol with our free item interaction when fighting strictly in melee to get the better damage dice. And then we can use another item interaction to draw it on a future turn if we need it. This mixing up our style will become more relevant next level when we get Step of the Wind and we'll be able to move in and out of combat more freely. First level fighters also get Second Wind, letting them use a bonus action once per long or short rest to heal 1d10 plus their fighter level and hit points. As a DM, I've noticed that players often either forget to use this or try to save it and end up going into a rest with it unused. So try and use it whenever you think you need it, because it's a lot more useful than it seems. Mm -hmm. At third level, we take second level of monk. At second level, monks get key points. They have a number of these equal to their monk level, and you can use them for a variety of different things. Key points are a limited resource, and you will feel like you never have enough, but they do return on a short or long rest. So even though you should use them strategically, don't be afraid to use them when needed. It really sucks going to a rest with key points that you could have used in, enc in encounters. At this level, we can spend key points on a few different things. One is Step of the Wind, allowing you to spend a key point to take the dash or disengage action as a bonus action on your turn, and it doubles your jump distance until the end of your turn. This will allow us to use disengage to get out of melee and use our pistol or crossbow when that would be better, and to sheath it and step into melee when that would be more to our advantage. Dashing as a bonus action also has some use allowing us to quickly close with an enemy and still attack or to get out of range of an enemy so we can shoot it from a safe distance. As we aren't particularly strong, our jump distance isn't going to be great, even doubled, but we do have athletics proficiency and the DM has the option to let us make a jump check farther than normal so this ability could still allow you to do cool things like jump between rooftops or jump up and grab the bottom of a second story balcony uh, to climb up as long as your DM is cool with that sort of thing. Another key ability is patient defense, which lets a monk spend a key point to use a dodge action as a bonus action. This is a pretty slept on ability, but it is pretty powerful. The dodge action gives advantage on all dexterity saves for the turn, and enemies have disadvantage on all attacks against the person dodging. 
Using an action to do this is usually not a great idea as you are giving up your action just to avoid damage for the turn. Doing it as a bonus action is great though, letting you get in your full attack and making it hard for your enemy to attack you in return. Lastly, the monk can use Flurry of Blows. They can spend a key point after taking an attack action to make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action. This is a nice improvement over the single bonus action attack they get from martial arts. But this ability doesn't say you have to take the attack action with an unarmed strike or monk weapon, so you can shoot someone with a pistol or hand crossbow and then punch them twice in the face. <laughs> Second level monks also get unarmored movement. Whenever not wearing armor or using a shield, their movement is increased by 10 feet, and this improves as the monk reaches higher levels. At fourth level, we're taking third level of monk, getting a monastic tradition, and we want the way of the Kensai. These monks specialize in mixing weapons with martial arts smoothly and flawlessly. Monks of this tradition gain Kensai weapons, which can be any simple or martial weapon. If you are using firearms, they are considered martial weapons for this purpose. These weapons cannot have the heavy or two-handed property, and the monk can choose two of these weapons, one melee and one ranged. For the ranged weapon, we are going to take our pistol or hand crossbow. For the melee weapon, it depends on what you envision your character. We see this as a gun food type brawler. We are choosing a dagger for our melee weapon, but if you see this character as more like Beatrice Kiddo from Kill Bill, for example, you could instead use a longsword, reflavoring it as a katana, and can even wield it two-handed thanks to the versatile property. Kensai monks gain Agile Parry. When holding a melee Kensai weapon and make at least one unarmed strike as part of your attack action, you add plus two to your armor class until the start of your next turn. This adds another tactical choice we have to make. Do we fight with no weapon in hand in order to get the D8 damage dice? Do we keep our pistol in hand to attack ranged targets or even shoot someone right next to us? Or do we fight with a dagger in our hand in order to gain the armor class bonus? This gives us a lot of options, but that also means that we have a lot of flexibility to choose whatever works best for us in a particular situation. Kensai monks also gain Kensai shot. On your turn, you can use a bonus action to make your shots more deadly. Until the end of your turn, all ranged attacks you make deal an extra D4 damage of the weapon's type. If you haven't played a monk before, you are probably noticing that you have a lot of options for your bonus action and only get one per turn. That is both a blessing and a curse of playing a monk. The blessing is you always have something to do with your bonus action, giving you a big advantage in a game where the action economy is a very important resource. The curse is that you have a lot of abilities that you have to choose from, and sometimes you will have multiple ones that you would like to use on the same turn, but you can't. Overall, it isn't a drawback at all, but for people new to playing a monk, it can be very frustrating. This character in particular is designed to have a large number of options, so when playing it, be prepared to make tactical choices every round of combat. Also at this level, Kensai monks get way of the brush. Being a civilized and refined warrior, and not a simple brute with a blade, you gain proficiency with calligraphy supplies or painter supplies. Third level monks also gain deflect missiles. When attacked by a ranged weapon, the monk can use its reaction to reduce the missile damage by 1d10 plus the monk level and dexterity modifier. If the damage is reduced to zero and the weapon is a light enough to be held in one hand, the monk can throw it back as part of the same reaction. It counts as a monk weapon, has a short range of 20 feet and a long range of 60 feet. Since it counts as a monk weapon, it deals our martial arts die in damage unless the weapon deals more damage. So not only could our guy block bullets, he can catch them and throw them back at you hard enough to put holes in you. <laughs> at fifth level, we take fourth level of monk, getting an ability booster feat. What we take here depends on what feat we took at first level. If we took crossbow expert, our dexterity is 16, and we're going to use the ability boost to make it 18. If we took the gunner feat, our dexterity is 17, so we're going to take the piercer feat, which will give us a plus one to strength or dexterity, and we'll use it to make our dex 18. It also lets us re-roll the damage we make with a piercing attack once per turn. Also, on a critical hit with a piercing weapon, we can roll an additional dice of that weapon's damage. This feat will work with our pistol or hand crossbow, and also with a dagger or short sword. Also, since the dagger is a monk weapon, its damage dice should be the same as your martial arts dice, but because of the way the piercer feat is worded, you'll want to check with your DM. Mm -hmm. This is pretty clearly how it should work, but rules as written here, there could be some questions about it. Fourth level monks also get slow fall, letting them use their reaction to reduce any falling damage they take by five times their monk level. So if you need to jump out of a third story window to chase down an enemy or escape from one, that isn't a problem. Mm -hmm. At sixth level, we take fifth level monk, getting extra attack. This allows the monk to make two attacks instead of one when taking the attack action. 
In addition to the obvious advantage of more chances to do damage, this also gives us a little more flexibility. When we only had one attack, we had to attack with an unarmed strike to get the benefit of Agile Parry. But now we can punch someone, then stab or shoot them, and still get the armor class bonus. Fifth level monks also get Stunning Strike. When they hit an opponent with a melee attack, the monk can spend one key point to cause them to make a constitution save or be stunned until the start of the monk's next turn. The DC for this and any other key ability that allows a save is 8 plus proficiency bonus plus wisdom modifier. Now, Zephiel plays monks, and he plays them well. Hmm. As his DM, I've lost track of the times that he has ruined my bad guy's plan of attack with a well-timed stunning strike. Yep. The monk's martial art die also becomes a D6 at this level. At 7th level, we take 6th level monk, getting key empowered strikes. This is the main reason we wanted to focus on monk at the early levels. Now the monk's unarmed strikes count as magical for the purpose of overcoming damage resistance. This is essential for a character that wants to punch things in a world where things exist that magically resist being punched. Yeah. Sixth level Kensai monks also get magical Kensai weapons, allowing their Kensai weapons to also count as magical for overcoming damage resistance. So that you no longer need silver bullets to kill that werewolf, your trusty pistol will do the job all on its own. Mm -hmm. At this level, Kensai monks also get Death Strike, allowing them to spend a key point when they strike a target with a Kensai weapon to have that weapon deal extra damage equal to a roll of their martial arts dice. At 8th level, it is tempting to continue with Monk for a few more levels to get evasion and another ability boost, and you can do that if you like. Uh, just shuffle around the order of the levels, but there are things we want from Fighter, so we're going to go back to Fighter for a while, taking 2nd level of Fighter. 2nd level Fighters get Action Surge. Once per long or short rest, they can take an extra action on their turn, allowing them another full attack action, which is the most common way to use this, or we could attack and use the dodge or disengage action, saving both the key point and a bonus action for something else. At ninth level, we take third level of fighter, getting our martial tradition. There are several martial traditions that would work well with the Kensai Monk. Rune Knight and Psychic Warrior could be great for a different kind of character, but we are going for a Masterful Warrior, and for that we are taking the Battle Master. First off, we get Student of War, which gives us proficiency with artisan tools of our choice, which can either be painter supplies, calligraphy supplies, whichever we don't have. If we have both, perhaps we want to expand our artistic endeavors with Sculptor's Tools. More importantly, we gain four superiority dice, which are D8s, and we can use for maneuvers. We start with three maneuvers and learn more at higher levels. One thing about maneuvers is that the way they are worded isn't very consistent. Some say melee attack, some say weapon attack, and some say melee weapon attack. For the most part, it doesn't matter. The way 5th edition rules work is unarmored strikes count as melee weapons unless an ability is worded as an attack with a weapon, so all the battle master maneuvers will work with unarmed strikes. There is one that is questionable, and unfortunately it is the one that we want, and that is Brace. It doesn't say attack with a weapon, so it should be fine, but it does say within the reach of the weapon we are using. I think rules is written, and unarmed strike would count as the weapon you are using, but the way it is worded leaves a lot of room for interpretation, so check with your DM if they think it only works with a weapon. You might consider taking a different maneuver, or just using this one with your dagger, but that would limit your options a little bit. For this build, however, we are taking Brace, and what it does is when an opponent moves within the reach of your weapon you are using, normally 5 feet for unarmed strikes, the Battlemaster spins its reaction and a superiority die to make an attack with the weapon against the opponent, and if it hits, add the superiority dice to the damage of that attack. The second maneuver we want is Trip Attack. When the Battlemaster hits an opponent with a melee attack, it can spend a superiority dice and to force the opponent to make a strength saving throw or be knocked prone and they add the superiority dice to the damage. Prone enemies have disadvantage on attacks, and melee attacks have advantage against them. However, ranged attacks have disadvantage against prone enemies, so as cool as it would be to backhand someone to the ground and then shoot them, it's not going to be a great idea. Also, a number of enemies have a good strength save, so use this carefully. The last maneuver we want is menacing attack. We are an intimidating guy in battle, and this lets us spend a superiority dice when we hit an opponent with a melee attack to force them to make a wisdom save or be frightened of us until the, t until the start of our next turn. Frightened creatures have disadvantage on attacks and ability checks as long as they can see us and can't willingly move closer to us, so this is another powerful effect. The save DCs for these and all other maneuvers is 8 plus the proficiency bonus plus either your strength or dexterity modifier, and obviously we're going to be using our dexterity modifier. 
superiority dice recharge on a short or long rest. This is a theme for us. We have a lot of limited resources, key points, superiority dice, action surge, and second wind, but they all come back on a short rest. So unlike many characters, we can take a quick nap and be back in the fight instead of having to take camp every time we run low on spells. We are also perfectly effective even after we have used up our limited resources, so as long as we aren't dead, we are still going strong. <laughs> At 10th level, we take our 4th level of fighter, getting another ability score improvement or feat, and we're going to cap our dexterity at 20. This improves all of our attacks, our armor class, and the save DC for our battle master maneuvers, and our stealth and acrobatic skills, so it's an all-around all-star stat for us. At 11th level, we take 5th level of fighter, which would normally give us extra attack, but we already have it from Monk, so we don't get much from this level except hit points. Hmm. At 12th level, we take 6th level of fighter, getting another ability booster feat, and we want to get our wisdom up to 16 for better armor class, perception, and more effective stunning strikes. And at 13th level, we take 7th level of fighter, and our martial archetype gives us the ability Know Your Enemy, which allows us to study an enemy for one minute to learn a variety of information about them. There's a bit to this, so you'll want to read it for yourself, but it's one of those abilities that's only good as your DM wants it to be. In the right situations or the right type of campaign, it can be very good, but in a straight-up dungeon crawl, you will probably never use it. We also gain a fifth superiority dice for even more fun. Hmm. At 14th level, we take 8th level fighter, getting another ability score improvement or feat. And as much as I want to get our wisdom to 18, our constitution is too low for a guy slugging it out with fiends and giants, mm -hmm. so we're going to increase it to 16. As Appeal said earlier, as long as we aren't dead, we're going strong, and some extra hit points and better constitution saves will help us with the not being dead part. Yeah. <laughs> At 15th level, we take 9th level fighter, getting a use of Indomitable, which allows us to reroll a failed save. Sadly, unlike our other abilities, this only recharges on a long rest. I'm not sure why, it breaks the pattern for fighter abilities, and even though it's good, it isn't so strong as to need the extra limitation. It's not as if fighters are overpowered. Yeah. It hasn't come up in my campaign, but if one of my players wanted to house rule it to be used once for short or long rest, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. At 16th level, we take 10th level of fighter. Our superiority dice improve and become D10s, and we learn two more maneuvers. The first we want is repost. When a creature misses us with an attack, we can use our reaction and spend a superiority dice to make an attack at that creature, adding the superiority dice to the damage if the attack hits. And just because we are going all in on bonus actions, the second maneuver we want is quick toss which lets us spend a superiority dice to draw and throw a weapon that has the thrown property, such as our dagger, and if it hits, we add the superiority dice to the damage. This gives us another way to get an extra attack using our bonus action. And I think shooting a guy and throwing a knife at him just seems like the sort of thing this character would do. We should probably start carrying a couple of extra daggers around, and remember, daggers are a monk weapon, so we use our martial arts die for damage rather than a d4. At 17th level, we take 11th level of fighter, getting improved extra attack, letting us attack three times instead of two when taking the attack action. Now our number of attacks is getting pretty impressive. We can make three attacks with any of our weapons or punches and follow it up with another punch as a bonus action or two more punches if we spend a key point for the flurry of blows. Or at range, we can fire three shots with our pistol and then spend a superiority dice to toss a dagger at them too. Not only that, we will be using our reaction to attack opponents that come within our reach with brace or opponents that miss attacks. We'll be using our repost or is using deflect missiles to throw their ranged weapons back at them. But we are going to be making a lot of attacks either way. <laughs> and at 18th level, we take 12th level fighter, getting another ability score booster feat. And now we're going to make that wisdom 18, getting a little more armor class and making our stunning strikes a little bit more effective. Mm -hmm. At 19th level, we are finishing off the build with Monk. At 7th level Monk, we get Evasion. When we succeed on a Dexterity save that would normally let us take half damage, we take no damage instead, and even if we fail, we only take half damage. Even though this ability would have been great to have early, it's, it's good at any level, mm -hmm. and a lot of enemies at this level will have some powerful spells and ability that this will save us from. 7th yeah. level Monks also get Stillness of Mind, allowing them to use an action to end an effect that is frightening or charming them. Being frightened or charmed by some of the enemies you will face at this level is usually pretty bad, so this is a welcome addition to our abilities. And at 20th level, we get our last ability booster feat, and we have options. Capping our wisdom will give us a base 20 armor class and really strong stunning strikes, but more constitution or tough feat will increase our survivability. I think we'll increase our constitution to 18, both for the hit points and the constitution saves, but it's a hard call. Any of the choices would have been equally good. Mm -hmm. I think this character is strong and well-rounded, great at punching, which is what Joe Davis asked for, but able to do a lot more. Obviously, we patterned this character after John Wick and other gun-fu type figures, but it doesn't have to be limited to that. 
Kensai monks have many weapon options, and the character could favor sword play over punching. Mm -hmm. Also, if one wanted a character that's more medieval Europe in flavor, it could take the sharpshooter feat instead of gunner or crossbow experts and use a longbow and longsword, backing it up with unarmed strikes. There are a lot of ways to go with this without making major changes to the build. Also, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of flexibility in the order the levels are taken in. As long as you get key empowered strikes before you start encountering a lot of enemies with damage resistance, you can change things around without losing much effectiveness. Mm -hmm. We hope Joe likes this build and it gives him the kind of character he would like to play. If you have any questions, comments, or build requests, please leave them in the comments section below. Now that we are done with the Ravnica series, we'll be taking more build requests. We hope you will all join us next time when we do a build for Thiago Carvalho 4627 and they want a character based on the Jeskai Way from Magic the Gathering. I'm really excited about this build. It's going to be a lot of fun and using classes we haven't used before. And until then, cheers. cheers.